بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Today inshallah we will study the fourth major fiqhi rule القاعدة الفقهية الكبرى and that states لا ضرر ولا ضرار and among the jurors, they know it as al-darar yuzal, harmful things must be removed. But some jurors, some scholars use the first one because it is the exact words of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. La darar wa la dirar. And this means that there should be no harm nor any reciprocating harm. What is the difference? Because they are, in a sense, similar. لا ضرر meaning that you do not initiate this harm for no reason and this is normal definitely Islam prohibits this you going to someone in school and bullying him or hitting him why? I felt like doing so this is totally prohibited you get kids walking in the streets with an iron nail and whenever they pass by cars they scratch the paint. Why are you doing this? Is there any benefit for you? No. This is totally prohibited in Islam. The Prophet says, alayhi salatu salam, al-Muslimu man salim al-Muslimun min yadihi wa lisanihi. A proper Muslim is the one who other Muslims are safe from his hands and from his tongue, meaning that he would not implement any harm to them, neither physically nor rhetorically, by using words. So this is understood, la darar. You should not initiate it. Wala dirar, meaning that you should not reciprocate it. And this means that you may do something that would cause harm unintentionally or intentionally, as in the case of someone building a fire in his property this is your right but if this fire would extend to burn your neighbor's house this is haram this is reciprocating harm this is of course unlike the first one la darar the one who goes and sets his neighbor's house on fire why are you doing this i like to see any fire no this is totally prohibited and the one that might be justifiable in your property if it reciprocates harm to others, it becomes haram. And this is one of the beautiful rules in Islam, that if it is explored properly, it would call people to Islam. Because this is part of Islam, to the extent that some of the scholars even make it half of Islam. And how is that? They say that Islam is based on two things, attaining and bringing benefits and preventing and eliminating harm. And they call it in Arabic, and you'll always hear this if you study Islamic Sharia, ah, you will always hear this statement, which is derived from this hadith. Jalbu al-masalih wa dar'u al-mafasid. Ibn Taymiyyah says, may Allah have mercy on his soul, the whole of Islam is based on this, on bringing and attaining benefits and completing it. Because you can bring the core of it, but there are things that complete it. And it is based on preventing harmful things and reducing it. Maybe I cannot prevent all of it, but at least I can reduce it. And this is Islam. In a nutshell, no matter where you look at the teaching of Islam, you will find this rule applicable. That you will bring and attain and complete the good and you will prevent and reduce the evil and the bad. So this rule that states that harm should be prevented, whether initiated or reciprocated, 
there are three types of harm that are exempted. First of all, the harm of implementing the major prescribed punishments. This is harm, isn't it? When you come to a person, a murderer, and you say, we have to execute you. A soul for a soul, a life for a life. This is justice. Or we come to someone who steals from others and we say, we have to amputate your hand so that this is a punishment and a deterrent for others. So these punishments include harm on the recipient, but this harm is not included in the hadith la darara wa la dirar, because it is needed and it's part of protecting the sharia. Ah. Second type of harm is when the harm is negligible. So I sell you a house. Now, there might be some harm on you not to know what the foundations are made of, what's the diameter of the steel poles or the iron poles used, what kind of cement. But this is negligible. This harm is negligible and it is almost impossible to stay away from it. When I sell you a jacket, I have to make it clear to you that it is a ready to use jacket. There is no defects in it, nothing wrong in it. But what about what's inside the jacket, the filling of the jacket? What type is it? This I do not know and you do not know. So not knowing it is negligible. The third type of harmful things that are exempted, personal harm. So yes, la darara wa la dirar. The harm is to be removed, but if I personally accept to void and waver my right in this harm, this is permissible. Someone slanders me and accuses me of adultery. The Islamic ruling is he must provide four witnesses. If he fails, he should be flogged 80 lashes. Whose right is it? It is my right. So if the judge says, flog him, and I say, I forgive him, then this is my own right to forgive, and hence this part of harm is exempted from the hadith. Now, there are a number of sub-rules, but they all revolve around the same ruling, which is very important because you have to evaluate things before thinking or saying that I have the right or not. The first rule is yuzal. Harm should be removed. And this is the main rule that jurors use, but it is stemmed from la darara wa la darar. Now, harm can be partially removed after it takes place, or totally removed, or partially prevented before happening, or totally prevented. So the rule harm should be removed can apply to all four. Can you give us an example? Yes, harm should be removed. I have a house, my neighbor is next to me. He grows a tree where all the leaves and branches are in my house. And I every single day clean my garden and I remove the leaves, and it's taking space in my garden. So this is harmful for me. It is my right to remove the harmful. So this has to be removed. It can be removed totally, and it can be removed partially. So I have to begin with partially. If this doesn't help, then I have to do it totally. So I'll tell my neighbor, it is your obligation to cut the branches coming into my home. If he does this, alhamdulillah. If he refuses, then I go to the court and the court says that he has to remove the whole tree. Sometimes removing the branches would not do because the roots are coming to my home under the fence and causing me trouble. I have the right to remove this harm. I have the total right. So it's either partially removed or totally removed, which brings us to the second rule, which is, الضرر يدفع بقدر الإمكان.
harm should be avoided as best as possible. So the best thing is to cut the branches. If this does not do the job, then remove it totally. Because Allah says, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُمْ Fear Allah to the best of your ability. So I can take steps that would make this easier. And removing such harm is either for the good of the community or either for the personal benefit. For example, لا ضرر ولا ضرر and the rule that we have just stated that harm should be avoided as best as possible. Now, when we come to issues in the public interest, so jihad may inflict harm, but this harm is justifiable because it is in the case of defense of Islam. Why is jihad mandated upon the Muslims? For da'wah purposes and for protection. It is never to be the aggressor. Jihad is never to be the aggressor and to inflict harm on people. It is to spread the word of Allah Azza wa Jal and also it is to protect Islam and the Muslims. So this might sound like harm to the enemies, but this is intended and it is needed. And likewise in issues of capital or prescribed punishment. This harm is needed to be inflicted on the individual for the safety of the whole community. We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah we'll be right back. Al Aziz, Al -Aziz. The, Almighty. the Almighty, Al Wadud, Al -Wadud. The, All the All Loving, Al Tawab, The Acceptor of Your Return, Al Razak, The Provider. Al-Raqib, the all-watchful. Walillahi al-asma'u al-husna, to Allah belongs the beautiful names. Fad'uhu biha, to call him upon them. To understand more of Allah's beautiful names, join me, your brother Majid Mahmoud, on my new series about understanding Allah's beautiful names on Peace TV. Don't miss the chance to comprehend the seamless explanation of Allah's beautiful names in Understanding Allah's Beautiful Names every Sunday at 7 p.m. and repeat telecast at 12 p.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. Dialogue. 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 Discussion. 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 Debate. 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 Rebuttal. 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 Conclusion. Conclusion. Eliminate misconceptions about religion. Get enlightened. Witness Dr. Zakir Naik in a battle of words in Crossfire every Friday at 8.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 10 a.m. Saudi Arabia on Peace TV. Message. Maliki, Hanafi, Shafi'i, or Hanbali. The difference of opinion now, people are going to say, do we have to follow? Do we not have to follow? Ask the people who have knowledge. Biggest problem is with the blind followers of Imams of the wrong path. Muslims need to be broad-minded in this respect. Whatever comes from the heart reaches the heart. Nowadays people will ask you, is this hadith in Bukhari or Muslim? 
Who is your Lord? Who is your Prophet? And what is your religion? How do we understand this in the light of Aqidah? Grasp the basics of belief from the scholars in Islamic Viewpoint. Next on Peace TV. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. Now when it comes to the issue of harm, the harm is either on you or on me. Because in the case of the neighbors, when your branches fall in my property, if I tell you cut the branches because they're harmful to me, you say, but cutting it is harmful for my tree. So the harm is there. And that is why we have to look in the best way to utilize how to minimize the harm and to see who is the aggressor and who is the victim. For example, there is what is known as the right of shuf'a. Ah. And shuf'a ah is a chapter in fiqh, in transactions. Shuf'a ah comes from the word shafr, which is two or even numbers. And this is when I have a house that is adjacent to my neighbor's house, or we are partners in a duplex, in a villa. He has the upper part and I have the lower part. Partners. And all of a sudden, I find out that he is selling it to someone else. He's selling his property to someone else. In Islam, there is harm on me because I like my partner, my neighbor. I have known him for 10, 15 years, and I'm happy with him. New owner of the property might not be as fitting to me as him. So Islam gives me the right to override his transaction and take the house for the same price. Meaning, my neighbor sold his house for a million reals to Abdullah. And Abdullah gave the money and uh, they doing the papers. I have the right to veto and say, no, this transaction is not going through. Abdullah, here is your one million reals. And the property is mine. Now, my neighbor may say, no, I don't want to sell it to you for a million. I said, ah, it's not your right. Now you want to cause harm for me. You agreed to selling it to that person for a million, and I'm paying you exactly the same. I have the right to override and take this property because we're neighbors. We have joint facilities, and this is harmful for me to bring someone else. So here, my neighbor has no harm. The property is sold. Abdullah, who was supposed to buy, has no harm because he's got his money back. So this is how we reduce the harm. And la darar wa la dirar. Likewise, if I have a rich brother who spends his money unwisely to the extent that he buys a pen, a normal fountain pen for $100,000 and he gives tips to waiters $1,000. So he's wasting the money. This is known in Sharia as as safih the person who is not controlling his actions and his wealth properly. Islam gives us the right to confiscate his wealth and prevent him from using it. Now I would say this is harmful for him. Now he cannot buy things, he cannot do things, yes. This is for the protection of his wealth from being spent unwisely. So in this case, there is harm inflicted upon him, but the actual harm, which is destroying the money unwisely, is more important to protect. So I hope this yani, clears out some of these things. Before moving to rule number three, do we have any questions? Yes. Sheikh, as you gave the example of Abdullah, that he, you give him a million and he, he, he's satisfied. But Abdullah, at the same time, he doesn't want to sell the house. He wants to keep the property for himself. And the question on the slander, which someone slandered you, and you forgave him. 
So we have in the lifetime of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that a woman was caught for stealing. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not forgive her. And is this which you mentioned, is it only specific to slander or for other crimes also? Okay. First of all, in regards to Abdullah wanting to keep the property, this is not an issue. The issue is, is there any harm on me if the property ownership is moved from my neighbor to someone else? And the answer is yes. I am not comfortable with someone else moving in. In this case, it is regardless what Abdullah wants to do with the property, to make money, to invest it, to live in it. This is beside the point. My point is that my neighbor cannot sell the property to someone else. Because he did so, I have the right to acquire his property with the same money that he has got. Now, when it comes to slandering someone, there are two rights in a crime. Either it's between you and Allah Azza wa Jal, or it's between you and someone else. For example, what's between you and Allah Azza wa Jal, if someone drinks intoxicants and becomes drunk, and he's not caught. The following day, is he obliged to go to the court and say, flog me, I, I consumed haram? No. He asks Allah for forgiveness and he conceals his sin. Now, when it comes to others' right, this, we have forgiveness and we have to take your right by court. For crimes such as murder, crimes that relate to your reputation, Islam gives you the right to forgive or to take compensation. If someone kills your brother, he's a murderer. Maybe he did it by mistake. No, 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 he did it deliberately. So Islam tells you, you have the right either to take the blood money, equivalent to 100 camels worth, or to forgive or to execute. This is up to you. Now, if someone slanders you and you forgive, you do not pursue and take it to the court. This is up to you. This is your right. If it is something that has reached the judge, we have general, what they call right and private right. When it comes to stealing, before going to the judge, if you forgive him, he's free. Once it reaches the judge and he rules that his hand to be amputated, then you cannot forgive. And there is a hadith that supports this when one of the companions was sleeping in the haram and someone stole his clothes. So they caught him and it reached the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered him to have his hand amputated. This is a crime. So the man said, because of my clothes, I give it a gift to him, Prophet of Allah. Forgive him. And the Prophet ﷺ told him, wouldn't you have forgiven him before he was brought in front of me? Khalas. Once he's brought in front of me and the judge says his word, this particular crime you cannot forgive because this is the public right. You're saving and protecting the public. As for when it comes to the murder case or to slandering, this is not what Islam wants you to do. This is all the time we have until we meet next time. Fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.